Hi there, I'm Sue, and welcome to the Gift Biz Unwrapped podcast. Whether you own a brick and mortar shop, sell online, or are just getting started, you'll discover new insight to gain traction and to grow your business. And today I have joining us Janet Domres. Janet works at Alden's Kennels. The business is a full service kennel offering boarding, training, rescue services, and other creative programs such as a children's vet camp. Janet's husband, Alden, ran the business for 15 years, literally through word of mouth and phone book listings. Meanwhile, in 2010, after a 28-year career in the postal service and six rotator cuff surgeries, Janet needed to make a change. She joined her husband at Alden's Kennels and approached the business with a mission to bring it up to date from a marketing standpoint. Without knowing a thing about computers, much less website construction or social media, Janet started the process of learning and creating, and Google became her best friend. Today, they have over 2,000 videos on YouTube and over 2,600 Facebook fans. Janet can equate the growth of their business to the visibility gained through online search. Now, there's a whole lot more to this story, but I'm going to let you hear it directly from Janet, and that's what we're going to get into now. Janet, thank you so much, and welcome to the show. Oh, well, thank you for having me. I'm so excited. I know. (laughs) Janet and I met at a local Chamber of Commerce event, and she and I just started talking. And the more she talked, the more I was like, oh my gosh, all of you guys need to hear her story. So I convinced her to come on. So yay. (laughs) Anyway, Janet, the way I like to start off is by having our listeners get a little bit of a different glimpse into who you are by having you describe a motivational candle. So if you were to help us envision your perfect candle, what color would it be? And what would be the quote on the candle? Oh, it would be a cream candle because a cream color reminds me something angelic. Like you have some kind of guardian angel that always finds some way to get you through the tough times to lead you, guide you, or do something like that. So cream would be my color for the candle to help you get through the tough times. Wonderful. And is that kind of the quote? An angel getting you, or do you have another quote for your candle? I'm not real good at the quote part, but it never hurts to have a guardian angel. There you go. I love that. (laughs) (laughs) And I agree. I agree with you totally. So Janet, let's start at the beginning. How did this idea of Alden's Kennels get established in the first place? Well, you know, I was from the city. My husband was a country boy. And um, when we had our first two children, I was a stay-at-home wife. He was a diesel mechanic at Patton Industries is the trade he took. But he gave me every animal I ever wanted. So we kind of lived out in the country. So I was raising Pomeranians, pet Pomeranians and having fun. And I met a couple show people and seen the difference between a show Pom and a pet Pom. So I just started with a couple litters and just learning how to market them. And Al had a terrible accident at work. So they called me and said, you know, uh, can you make it out there? And I says, no, I only have the one car and he's got it. So they picked me up. They brought me to the hospital and he had a very serious head injury. Oh dear. From a split rim that exploded. So he almost died. So he had about 17 operations. He could never return to his trade. We were married 10 years. We had two kids. I wasn't working. So I had to go and get the job at the post office. And he, instead of you know, making them pump gas. I said, stay home and take care of the dogs and I'll help you with the paperwork of how to sell them and that kind of stuff and market it. So he took care of all the animals and the kids for school. And I went to work at the post office. So we would have insurance. I didn't make anywhere near the kind of money he did. So he had to make money off of these dogs now. <laughs> right. So right. then I told him, I'll go meet those show people. So he got into the breeding program of breeding show dogs besides pet dogs. And that evolved. And then we finally had enough money to go from renting a place with horses and dogs to moving to this place. But he had to literally build the buildings for the dogs to go in. So he was building dog kennels, training facilities, raising the dogs, breeding the dogs, bottle feeding the puppies. It's a lot of work all of this, watching the kids so I could go to work at the post office. And I went to work there. And then I went to Midwest Dog Grooming School at night for nine months to be a dog groomer to help his business a little bit. 
So then on weekends, we would groom 20 dogs on a Saturday and Sunday to subsidize the palms a little bit. Then people wanted us to board dogs. So then we expanded and made a wing for boarding dogs. So Al was building this building and this business because he had lost his and he made a success. He started showing the dogs and winning. So we had exotic color Pomeranians that were sold internationally all over the world. And then you got the, the history of dogs. You know, it started coming around with rescue dogs. Breeders were bad people now. We're overpopulating the world. So if you aren't out showing and selling very expensive dogs, these poor pets weren't going to have a home because people were convinced they had to do rescue these dogs and adopt them. So we did. We took the dogs and made packages of 10 breeding stock and sold them to some of the best breeders in the country and in the world. And we le- were left with one dog, Bambi. And Bambi was our demo dog to show that a Pomeranian could do obedience. He could do shit sound work like a German shepherd. He could do a bark and hold. He could do tracking. And he shows the dogs how to go in and out of a dog door for the kennel part. He sells the obedience classes. He has a CD, a companion dog title. So, I mean, this dog is the only pet we have now. And now we cater to all our customers' dogs. But this all evolved over an accident and not knowing where to go and to raise two kids so they still had a decent life and could have their pets. And I could right. give them insurance. So you couldn't write this history. You know, you, you couldn't have started off and thinking this is what was going to happen. And it ended up being, you know, thank God he was okay, right? Exactly. But then merging exactly. into what you're doing today, it's crazy. How And you hear this over and over again, how businesses evolve from circumstances. Exactly. But the opportunities there, you've got to grab it. You've got to recognize it and grab it. And then, like you were saying, you know, it just kind of evolved from your husband working with the palms at home so that you could work. And then one thing led to another, led to another. And look at how great it is today. Yes, it was constantly changing. So, I mean, everybody's got to kind of look at that way. It's never going to stay the same. Whether it's a trucking business, you can see trucking businesses going under and some flourishing. We've got to look at why are those few flourishing? Is it their marketing plan? Have they added something to it? Have they looked and reached out to see what the customer wanted? So what we were good at raising palms and getting show dogs, the average person wasn't our target market anymore. So we needed to conform. Now we work with rescue dogs, training them. And with the veterans, my husband's a Vietnam veteran. Also, if a veteran comes in with a rescue dog, we give them free lessons so that that dog can be a good companion for them because most of them have post-traumatic stress. Right. So we've learned to use all of the resources and evolve with where the need is because it's constantly changing. The economy is changing. The people, what they want. Dogs are changing from show dogs to rescue dogs. I mean, if we would have been stuck in the the show part, Maybe we would have went under there. I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So tell us a little bit more. Okay. So so your husband owned Alden Kennels and you were off working in the postal service, a job that you said you loved, right? Yes, I did. Talk us through a little bit what happened and how you started integrating in with the kennels. Well, they were downsizing at the post office. And so I was on light duty because I had these surgeries from delivering the mail uh, for 20 years. And after six surgeries, I could not return back to the delivery. I could do light duty, but there was no work light duty for the, for me. So I missed out on my 30 year retirement. So at 28 years. Oh, you were so close, right? I was so close. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's quite a cut. So I says, well, I better help him with his business because what we had planned on with my <laughs> career just didn't pan out the way we had planned. Right. So I looked at it and I looked at what the other businesses were doing and these young dog trainers and stuff. They were all on the computer. They all had web pages. They had beautiful video showing what they did in the kennel when they were training, when they were boarding a dog, when they were interviewing a customer on, on the go home lesson. And I says, wow, that really is something because they're getting customers in and you couldn't do that with a phone book anymore. People just weren't calling on the phone book. Mm-hmm. So I've got competition too. There's about seven kennels in a five mile radius in my neighborhood. And um, so you had to be found. So I got on the computer and learned Google. 
Now, you got to remember, I'm old. I didn't know how to put a picture to an email. <laughs> so I don't know anything about a computer, right? So but I got my way through the computer and started Googling to find out what do the customers want? Where do they want to bring their dogs? What do they want to see their dogs do? I'm so out of touch with this computer thing. So I just Googled dog boarding, dog training, and all the neighborhoods around me all the way till I got to Chicago because it got more interesting the further I went out to see these fabulous things that we're doing. But it was social, I mean, because they showed the video, the picture, the website, all the stuff you couldn't do in a phone book. So that's how I kind of got started. I Googled a company that made websites. I had to make the back pages, but I told them, you got to teach me how to do it. I can't be calling you up every time I want to change, you know, a service or put a picture on. I says, that would cost me a fortune to hire somebody to update this. So I did find a company that could do that. So I think it took me about a month. They talked to me for one hour during the week and I would practice all week long and write notes if I couldn't remember the next step I was supposed to do or something like that. So it was at least four hours on the phone. The four week I was able to do any content I wanted, pictures, tag the pictures, open up a YouTube channel, do it with them. Um, a $99 camera at that time. They didn't, I didn't have a phone that could take a video. This was back in 2010. And um, there I was. I had my YouTube channel. Then I had to learn how to put my picture on the YouTube channel so they knew who it was if they wanted to subscribe to it, of course. And then put these videos on the website and then learn how to tag them. So I was learning all these things as I went along a little at a, at a time to see what's the easiest way they could find me. So the reason I have 2000 videos is that's what I do for my customers. If they're getting a nature walk, I video the one time video and get their picture to go with it and put that on our Facebook page and tie the Facebook page with our website. If they get playtime or a lesson, they get a video. So then to make it like a phone book, I would direct these videos to different towns, like a nature walk in Highland Park, for instance. And tag it that way. And Highland Park, they would find Alden's Kennels. Wow. All right. I'm going to stop you here because there is so much here. But now, seriously, Janet, before you started, when you were working with the post office and then you took the break and then you started working with all of this, did you have any marketing background, classes, courses, knowledge at all? No. I didn't even know a business person. You know, it's so interesting because you did two things that people talk about all the time and you just did them naturally. One of the things and gift biz listeners, we've talked about this before is being resourceful, you know, finding the answers and especially now online, there's so much out there. But so Janet didn't just say, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not doing it. She took on the challenge and then she went and figured out a couple of things, you know, under this resourcefulness category. One, which is so important, and people forget to do this all the time, you were saying, Janet, that you went to see what the customers wanted, right? So you were yes. looking at the customer and providing the solution that you didn't think you knew what the customers wanted. You proved to yourself that these were the things that the customers wanted, which I think jump-started you right away in terms of the right path to go for you know, for getting visibility and resonating with people. And the other thing is in terms of finding someone to help you with that website, we don't always have to do it alone. And this is one critical place where so many people, when they're starting up and they're an entrepreneur, now granted the business was already running, but you were taking it in a brand new direction. We don't have to do things ourselves, And we so often, I think it was the podcast either one or I think it was two episodes ago. Now, I'm not sure exactly how we're going to schedule these out, where Vivica Von Rosen from LinkedIn was talking about how we often are so late when we finally bring in some extra help. We try and do everything ourselves. You didn't do that, Janet. Just naturally, it's, it's pretty incredible. Naturally, you went out and said, you know, I'm going to have someone help me build this website so we can get up and running, but then I want to know how to do it for the future. So... Super kudos to you because those are two things that many people don't come upon until later in the game. So that got you started towards success really quickly. Talk to us a little bit more about the evolution of the video. So you were just describing how 
every chance you get, you take photos with customers in whatever they're doing. But it didn't start that way, right? You were mentioning you were working with a camera camera instead of a phone camera way in the beginning, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was pretty primitive. So you had to learn how to do it. And, you know, YouTube changes all the time, just like Facebook and everything else. So you had to learn it and then relearn it and add to it. And then, you know, it was almost three years before I upgraded the video equipment. But I mean, we did all right because I was being found. They always said, what are you advertising in Chicago? And I says, you know what, because they have the money to come. I'm cheaper than downtown Chicago and I can give them everything the best kennel can. And if I can't, I can outsource and find the kennels here that would have dock diving, I says, or a massage therapist or something like that, acupuncture. They want to go outside of it. We could do field trips. So that was another thing was if you don't have it, you can outsource it so that you have everything that customer wants. And the people appreciated it. And you go to the best places and then you video there. Here's your dog going to the field trip. It's going to (laughs) Camp Bow Wow to play day with its friends, you know. So, I mean, now how cool is that? Right, right. So they do come. (laughs) Yeah. And just for our listeners, how far outside of Chicago are you? Oh, I'm two hour drive usually. Two hour drive from Chicago. Yeah. But, you know, for those of you who aren't in the area or our international viewers or listeners, Chicago's a huge market. So two hours, there's, a, I mean, it's not like there's Chicago and then it's farmland and then there's Alden's Kennels. I mean, there's a lot of homes and all of that in between, but it is and away a lot from of the city. too, Sue. A lot yeah. of businesses they're passing that are kennels and they come to me because they saw the video. They saw what the place looks like. Right. So do you have any suggestions for any of our listeners who are hesitant about doing video? They're making it easier all the time. Mm -hmm. So just dive right into it on all aspects. Some companies even offer some little classes for, you know, $79.95, two or three hours. If you want to go live on Facebook or something, that's a video you're doing. You could do it on your phone. The phones are fabulous now for it. And just about anybody will open up a YouTube channel for you if you can't do it yourself. But it's, it's like any other online account, just like if you're buying at Amazon, more or less. You can create your account almost the same simple way. So if you're a shopper online, all this stuff will be so easy for you. And don't be afraid of it. People want to see where they're going or they want to see the product or see you make the product. Whatever, you know, whatever platform you want to do, you know, YouTube really helps. So is is it kind of your, are you always doing the videos or do you have other employees doing videos? How's that working? Well, I usually have other people do the aspects of working with the dog. I'm usually doing all the videos. My husband can do the videos now. I've trained him that he can. Some of the employees kind of are learning to hold the camera a little slower so they don't move it too fast and stuff. Mm -hmm. And Uh, so is video your prime method? Like you're not doing blog articles or anything like that. It's mostly video and you're bringing that over to Facebook so people can see that and that's it, right? And I have some pictures on Pinterest. I do a little bit of Instagram. I have a lot of tweets going out. The videos go on the tweets. I connect them with a lot of it too. I have my YouTube so it can go out to LinkedIn and several other formats too. When I want to show something like a training class and we're opening a new, you know, one starting up, you want to see when one was like before. So Mm -hmm. I would post something like that once in a while in LinkedIn. So I use the video in all the other social media platforms because I'm not a good writer. Mm -hmm. If I could write, I'd be writing blogs because I'm old. I've got a lot of experience. I know the topics, but I'd rather show you than write it. Well, and video is so much better than the written word right now. I mean, everyone, Facebook, everything is favoring video now, live streaming and video. So you're right on target with what the hot item is these days. (laughs) Well, that's good news. (laughs) So talk to us about a time when there was a struggle within the business, either the business overall, or as you were getting up to speed with social media and computers and all that. Well, right before I left the post office, the business was Well, they said the recession was like 2008. Well, yeah, we had less customers. So we ran a tighter budget to compensate. We just blamed it all. The economy's bad. So we're not going to, people aren't traveling. You know, the housing industry, all our uh, blue collar people are not vacationing. We blamed it on all that. And it was not that. 
it was the phone book. Nobody was using the phone book and that's all we were using or a couple newspaper ads. So when the internet broke in and I, I decided I had to do it because the younger people were doing it and they were being found when you Googled them and we weren't anywhere to be found. I says, this is, I've got to do this or you might as well close your doors. Mm -hmm. When they stopped coming, it's not because we didn't do the service and we didn't do a good job. They didn't know we were here. Right. So we had, that was the biggest thing was people need to know you're there. They need to know you're current with what they want as things change because the dog industry, believe it or not, pet industry changes very fast. It didn't years ago, but now it does. They want to have the California dog, you know. What does that mean? What does the California dog mean? You go out to dinner with your dog at the restaurant oh. now and on the patio. You're at the beach with them. Uh, you know, there's swim dates. There's play dates for your pets. There's massages. There's spa day, peppermint baths, blueberry facials. I mean, there's all this stuff that you could do for your pet that, that we didn't think about. Can I come and and live there too, a blueberry facial? (laughs) Yes, it's just what they want for their pet. What what you have for yourself, people want that for their pets now, believe it or not. And we're going to make sure we find out where we can get it done for them if we can't do it ourselves. That's crazy. We'll outsource it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Gift Biz listeners, this is another good point that I just want to continue to reinforce is over time, you know, hopefully we all start businesses that are going to last for years, right? But over time, businesses change, you know? I mean, I just recently in my hometown, we're seeing a fur shop that's been here forever shuttering their doors. Why? That's not really something that people are as interested in in this day and age anymore. You know, the, you know all the natural and the green and all of that doesn't really equate to people having furs. Janet's talking about how everything's changing with her industry and she had to evolve to stay relevant. Same thing for us, for all of our industries. I don't care what you're doing. You need to really be watching and make those pivots with your industry so that you're always right on top of the trends, staying timely with whatever your product is, whatever the colors are, whatever the styles are, if that relates to your product, tastes, you know, if you're a baker all that type of thing. You have to be very conscious and make changes as you go. Your business, even of six months ago or a year ago, might not be as relevant as what's currently happening today. So you need to stay on top of what's going on. Would you say anything else about that, Janet? You know what? You got the truth. Join a chamber, meet the other business people. You'll see the ones that are making it and the ones that are struggling and they're good at what they do, but they haven't kept up with the social media and the internet. That's the only thing that they left out and their their business is going to the wayside. So, you know, chambers can share their, their information with you too, the business people. If they're prosperous, you're going to prosper too. So you got to help each other. So I just love meeting the people, the business people. I never got to meet years ago working at the post office. I was so secluded from that. So I'm learning now too what, what they're successful in, what they're not and what businesses within the chamber can help you grow yours. Yeah. All right. So Janet, this is a perfect segue into us talking about what you do with that super exciting networking event that you have going on. So I want you to take it from the top and tell, you know, fill all of our listeners in on what you're doing. Well, my biggest advertising and social event that helps in advertising is a multi-state mixer. I went to other people's mixers for two years before I planned my first one. And I saw everything I liked, everything I wanted to add, some things that weren't so good. And when we created it, it was, to tell you the truth, it was a, a good success. There was at least 150 people there. All right, let's start. What, so what made you decide in the very beginning that you were even going to do this? You were going to all these other events. Who would think as a kennel that you would want to do a mixer? Where did the, that thinking come from? Well, I, I was hesitant because you, you serve food and everything else. We have a training hall. So I had to make sure that if there's food that they had to think that they weren't in a kennel eating food. And I had to say, what's going to draw them there? So you had to have raffles. And then you had to have people they wanted to meet. So by me belonging to all these chambers and going to all the events, I met all these hundreds of people that are in the most unique businesses you ever could imagine. So by the promise of them meeting people outside of their own little chamber, 
they were kind of excited about that. So I did use Facebook, Facebook events, email, constant contact. I'd send out, uh, you know, flyers through there and invite them and tell them they were going to meet somebody. Hopefully at the end of this event, only two hours, we would serve them, you know, some drinks and food. And we had a chef serving them. It wasn't just hors d'oeuvres on the side. And it just grew from there. So every year it's gotten bigger. I think this last one was 300 people and it's free for them. They don't have to pay a thing. And now some of the uh, vendors, they want to be sponsors because they're in front of an audience of business people instead of paying for, you know, an expo and a booth and a lot of giveaways. Now they're giving away something to show their service, which somebody probably could use them as a business. So you do that as a raffle or a silent auction, or what are you thinking with that? They serve the food or the rental equipment, the, the chairs oh, and I tables. Oh, I see. So, so you don't yeah. have to pay to put on the... Yeah, they're, they're helping out with... It's still... I have a budget, you know, that I have to meet there. But as it grows and you want it... And this is a red carpet affair. We have red carpets or we have the logos on the floor from Made in Vinyl. This is, you know, limos bring the executives. I mean, this is a real wow. red carpet. We want to serve our people the way they deserve to be as a business person. And then the plus for me, they see my location. And if they want to tour the kennel later, they can. I don't even have a chance to talk about my business. We're so busy. We had 30 raffles to raffle off. Some are golf outings, Cubs tickets, all different things. So people can be a part of it. So people would remember them that they were there. So it's getting to be one of the most popular events out here in McHenry County. It's crazy. It's multi-state and it brings in 300 plus people. And once a year, once a year. Once a year is all we can (laughs) plan all year for. Yeah. Are you able to equate it to increase business? Oh, yes, by far. If those people themselves don't have a dog or have a, a need for our kennel or training, they always have a friend they know. So they've made so many referrals saying, I've been there, I've seen the place. You know, the the kennel's gorgeous, the people have experience, and it's worth the drive if it's not in your backyard. So I get it from the the referrals that they know where I'm at. My town is only 832 people. So for me to be successful, I've had to reach outside of my little town. So that's why there's no limit. Right. We've talked before, Gift Biz listeners, about the power of communities. You know, if you're a shop, you can bring in a group of people surrounded, you know, with a common interest of the product of your shop, but maybe you do book clubs or knitting events or, you know, whatever relates to your business. This is so interesting because she's bringing people in. Um, many of them probably don't even have animals, right, Janet? But oh, they're exactly. coming in. They're coming exactly. in for a networking event because of the show that she puts on. You're listening to her, the red carpet and you know, limos and all of that. So it's clearly a talked about event and it's continued to grow over the course of time. How many years have you put this on now? Four years now we have put this on. Only four years, only four years. Would you give any advice to someone who is considering starting an event? Like think back to that very first one and what would be some advice if someone wanted to start something? Not even on a hundred you know, some people don't have the space, right? You're lucky to have space to be able to accommodate right. that. But even if you're going to do 20 or 30 people, what type of advice would you give somebody who's thinking about doing that? You know, first support your business people. If they're having mixers, support them by going to it. And that they can count on you then. They're going to return, come to yours to support you. You Good have point. to give, you have to give before you get. So not only did I learn by going to them, It was supporting them that somebody showed up for their mixer and supported their business and wanted to see it and share the experience and invite a friend to it and give them more exposure. And then you see how you can use that business network to invite people to yours so they do come and to find out what it's going to be to make them interested in coming. You know, is it going to be the location? Is it going to be your business? Is it going to be you? You're selling you. You are the business. And you, you can never forget that. This is what brings the people out. You have to support them. They'll support you. Mm -hmm. Did you do any, do you collect email addresses there or how does the process work? Like, how do you know how many people are coming? I count the business cards because when you do come in, that's all we ask you to do is to put a business card in the bowl for the raffle. The raffles are all free, but we pull a business card 
and any business is invited. You don't have to be a chamber member at this event, but you have to be a business. Mm -hmm. So if you have a business card, that's your ticket in, put it in the bowl. If your name gets picked, you win that raffle. And I can count those business cards at the end of the night. I have those. So that's more or less what I do. And I invite them for the following year. And then do you do it? So you put them on some type of an email list so that you have them for the next year. Yeah. Yeah. And that's all I use them for is for the uh, mixer invite. So you, okay. So, so, and they know that by entering into the raffle, they're not going to get on this email list where they're going to start getting all these emails because a lot of these folks don't have dogs, right? Right. Exactly. That's why I don't want to inundate them with that because they remember this mixer so much. They don't need to have emails to board their dog or anything. If they want to, they're going to come if they... Right. You know, if they want to give me the business. So sometimes you don't have to, you know, collect all of that. If you can give them something they can remember you by, you like your customers, when they're happy, your customers, they're always going to return. So this is what you want to do. You want right. to give first and you're going to receive. I think that's part of our success was the mixer and having other people meet people so they could make money and make that contact. If the people around you are successful, money's going to flow throughout all of them. That's right. You're absolutely right. All right. So Janet's three tips, if you think this is, might be interesting for you and your business, is one, first, give before you get. Go out and support other people's events. Be visible in your community. Number two is use your networking connections because you have been out and about to different chambers and other events. And those are people then that you can invite in, but you need to invite them in with a purpose, something that's going to be valuable to them. You know, time now is our most valuable commodity, right? So spending time anywhere needs to serve a valuable purpose in their minds. So Janet's talking about that. And then finally, collect the contact information. In, in her case, it's business cards that she's using so that they know about the event for the next year and it continues to build and build. I would suggest, depending on what your event is like, is you may also put them on some type of an email campaign. It just depends on how you're structuring everything. But we often talk about how do you collect addresses with their consent to be put on some type of a communication schedule. So great, great information, Janet. I really appreciate your sharing all of that with us. I'd like to roll now into our reflection section. This is a look at you in a little bit of a different way in terms of what you're doing throughout your day to be successful. If there was one trait that you would say, this is the one that's helped me be so resourceful, learn the computer, know about networking, you know, all these things that have been so great that we've been discussing, what would that trait be? Fear of failure. I will do anything to prove that I won't fail. You know, whether it's my marriage <laughs> or job or yes, yeah, so I was devastated when they let me go at the post office, but I wasn't going to fail. And the business, too, it was um, faltering a little bit. My husband has the same attitude. I mean, he probably would have worked himself to death trying to figure out how to bring customers in. But he didn't leave the property to know marketing changed. I was one to see that marketing changed. Right. And Interesting. that's what saved yeah. He worked hard and, and as hard as he has been the whole time, but it didn't make a difference. It's the times changed, the marketing plans changed, and that's the only thing that kept us from failing. So really important to know. Yeah, that's great. I love that fear of failure. So I would not have expected you to say that. So it's really interesting. What tool do you use regularly to help keep productive or to create some type of balance? Oh, just the, the chambers going out and socializing with people. And seeing what's happening in the neighborhood keeps my sanity. If I'm at home or at the business, I'm on the computer continually till my eyes are burnt out, trying to figure out all the new stuff that's coming out and Googling to see what changes in the business or out there helping him so he looks good in the video. Got it. And gives them what they want. Wonderful. And you're a people person, so that probably energizes you, you know, being yes. around, rubbing shoulders with other people, seeing else, what else is out there. I'm shy but I still want to be with people. So that's... You do not come across as shy in any way, shape or form. I mean, I've only met you once or twice now, but you don't seem to be shy at all. <laughs> well, I didn't even know how to introduce myself when I went in a mixer. It was, I'm Janet, I own a cow, you know? Well, I don't have a dog and they'd walk away. Do you know how many times that happened to me? Going to me and I kept pushing myself, pushing myself. But I found somebody that helped me do mm -hmm. a tagline. 
So sometimes you have to go outside for that help Mm -hmm. when you're not as creative as you think you are. (laughs) Right. And it sure helped me. It gave me more confidence and it polished it up a little bit. And kudos to you for continually going out there, even though you were uncomfortable with it. You know, just knowing that that was what you needed to do. And now I bet when you go to these chambers or other networking events, they know you. So it's now it's probably really easy. It's easier. It's still a struggle for me. My mother had the talent of going in a crowd and and being successful with strangers. I still have to struggle with it, but it's much easier with the tools that I've learned to use Mm -hmm. to get me through it. Good. So you just do it because you know it's worth it. Well, you you do enjoy. I do enjoy it. Because the introductions are one thing and then the conversations on the side are a totally separate thing. Right. So they both are there. Is there a book that you've read lately that you think our customers would find value in? You know, Elena McKenna was a good friend of mine. She's part of BNI. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't even remember the name of the book. It was, um, I read it in spurts, but uh, she was good at networking. One of the best people I've ever seen network. So sometimes if you read some of the books on networking, it helps you if you're struggling with that introduction and struggling on the, the follow-up. If you have a business to do a follow-up, that's great. You have to follow up. So it teaches you a lot and it gives you a lot more confidence and it grows your business. So a good resource for really learning how to network the right way? Yes. Okay. Reading I will Google what this book is and we'll put it in here for sure. Okay, thanks. All right, wonderful. And Gift Biz listeners, just as you're listening to the podcast today, you can also listen to audiobooks with ease. I've teamed up with Audible for you to be able to get a book just like Elena McKenna's for free. If you haven't done so already, all you need to do is go to giftbizbook.com and make a selection. That's giftbizbook.com. All right, Janet, I'd like now to offer you to dare to dream. I want to present you with a virtual gift. It's a magical box containing unlimited possibilities for your future. So this is your dream or your goal of almost unreachable heights that you would wish to obtain. Please accept this gift and open it in our presence. What is inside your box? It is a sky blue Pomeranian. Oh, (laughs) I have a Pom. Keep going. Really? I do. Yeah. You know, in 1991, I went out to California and I saw blue Pomeranians and they weren't the gray color. They were Like they're seriously blue? Blue. Seriously blue. What shade of blue? She had a navy blue. She had a sky blue. No. Yes. And you know, that's why that box is so important because if you haven't seen it, you think I'm crazy. (laughs) <laughs> if I didn't have another breeder friend with me to back it up that she saw it too, it was fabulous. And when you do the history of those exotic colors in England, the amount of numbers of dogs you had to breed to get that color was just astronomical. You need six generations of blue on both sides to get maybe one out of a hundred puppies born to be sky blue or royal blue or blue and not gray. Wow. I bet they are super expensive too. Yes. And they're hard to find. Yeah. They're hard to find. Very. I'm going to have to Google that now, too. (laughs) (laughs) You probably piqued all of our listeners' curiosity. Like, really? (laughs) Sky blue Pomeranian, everybody. You'll have to check it out. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, boy. All right. So if people were interested in knowing more about the kennel, where is the best place online that you would direct them? You know, just dog, you know, just Google it. Like your website or the? Or just Google dog boarding. Okay. Whatever town you want to do it in, I should come up on the first or second page, Alden's Kennels. And you can see the website or you can go to the videos, either or. Okay. All right. Super. And Gift Biz listeners, as you know, with every episode, there is an accompanying show notes page. And there we will have the website, the YouTube links, social media links, everything. So you'll be able to check it out. And maybe if I can find a fun picture of a Sky blue Pomeranian, maybe I should just put it up there for everybody to see. (laughs) Yes, do that. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So Janet, I really, really appreciate all the information that you've given us today. A little bit of a different look. I think it is super cool how you were able to go from seriously Yellow Pages marketing in 2010 to where you are today in such a short time. Kudos to you, really an applause. That is fabulous. And I really appreciate your sharing not only that, but all of the networking information. I think it might have sparked some ideas for people here. So you've paid it forward to help other people with their businesses today for sure. (laughs) 
So I appreciate it and continued success to you, Janet, with Alden's Kennels. Well, thank you so much, Sue. It has been exciting and I hope somebody can appreciate the struggle and there is success at the end of it if you can just don't give up. I think absolutely. Yeah. And you've helped towards that end for sure. May your candle always burn bright. Okay. Thank you.